Hello everyone, my name is Ramon Plana, as I Chemi said. Thank you very much for the invitation to participate in your groups, in your project. And as Chemi said before, he asked me to talk about a little bit about our experience in vermicomposting here in, in Spain. So I try to divide the presentation in two parts. One is more scientific point of view. I'm, I'm sure that many things that I'm going to, to tell, you already know it or you have heard about it. So I try to go fast for this part. And the second part of my speech is more about the industrial application of permicomposting in waste management and some experience here in Spain and also in, in other countries. So I think that that part is going to be much more interesting for you than mine. So first of all, let me introduce myself. I work as a freelance consultant in waste management, specialized in organic waste and in biological treatments like composting, anaerobic digestion and uh, vermicomposting also. I've been working almost all over the world in different kinds of projects. And before that, is, this activity began in 2007. Before that, I was in a research and development department in the big company, building composting facilities, and radiation facilities. We were in the research about the technology, the uh, improvement of the biological process. And before that, I was in the university working in composting and also in vermicomposting for different kinds of wastes. So I've been moving in the, in the three worlds, yeah, in research, application, and now in the consulting activities. So, that's me. And first of all, to talk about vermicomposting, I will say that the better definition should be that that is a process of bioxidation bio and stabilization of the organic matter with the action of the earthworms, but also other organisms that are mixed in this activity. From their activity, we reach a stabilized, homogeneous, and fine grained final product that we call vermicompost. Okay? So, first of all, is to understand that it's not only the earthworms that are important, it's the community that is created with the presence of the earthworms. So, and there are many advantages of this activity. You know that the worms are an elite, there are three groups, polychaetes, oligo oligochaetes, and irudinians. These are marine, oligo the oligochaetes is the only ones we are going to talk today, and the irudinians are in the sweet water, so it's not what is important that they have evolved from the aquatic environment to the ground. So they need to keep this capacity of breath through the skin to can keep their density, to can keep the body shape, and to can breathe. So this is the first uh, difficulty that we find when we work with them. We have to keep a very specific conditions in the environment to keep them alive and in good, uh, good shape. Okay, so this is very important to keep this capacity of internal homeostasis. So they need to keep this control of the internal media to eliminate the metabolic waste products without excessive loss of ions of water. This equilibrium they have between the environment and, and their body. This is essential to keep this capacity of uh, keep the moisture of the of the body and also the conductivity of the of the solid media where they are so they secrete they secrete this mu mucus that keeps the body surface moist and allows the respiration okay and at the same time is from where they excrete, excrete all the metabolic metabolic ay, metabolic products of their activity They are, as you know, in the environment, in the ecosystem. They live in the topsoil, most of them, but some of them, they are even in the deep ground. You can find them, and they are part of the feeding of other animals, you know, like birds, but also like the wild boars and others. You have three categories, epigeal, endogenous, and anesic. The epigeal are the, the ones that live in the, on, the, on the surface, in the first centimeters of the soil, you are going to find them and they are the majority of the, 
that are related to the composition of the organic matter. We have a very accelerated reproduction that is important for what we are looking for, and they are because they are expo exposure to multiple uh, predators. Endogenous, they are found inside the soil all the time. Okay, they are uh, deeper cap, uh, uh, deeper the uh, okay. parts of the soil, and they eat, of course, organic matter. But th those soils are not so rich in or in organic matter. But at the end, this group represents around almost 50 percent of the biomass of the European fertile soils. Finally, the nesics, they excavate vertical galleries. So this is not very common, and what they use, they eat the organic matter that fall in the, into this, uh, this gallery. Materials that can be vermicompost, of course, we are talking about organic materials, but they must allow the growth and the reproduction of the airworms. Okay, so this is a very important condition because chemical and physical characteristics of these materials are going to be key factors. The biodegradability of this material, the pH, the CN ratio, the content in ammonia, but also the inorganic salts, and finally the toxic elements. They are really delicate to toxics. And the physical characteristics, the humidity and the porosity of the material. So we have to know both group of characteristics to can determine if this uh, organic material is at the, in, in the first analysis, in the first study, if it is allowed to be degraded by the action of the worms or not. If I have to look for a worm to, do, to perform vermicomposting, I need one that is, has a preference for organic substrates with very short biological cycles, so we can reproduce it very fast, and also with a high reproductive capacity and resistant and tolerant. So this is what I will be looking for when I need a worm for vermicomposting. Which is the role? It's not only that they eat the, the, the organic waste. It's not just the feeding. It's also the mobility through the material. The capacity of mixing and aeration of the substrate that is going to encourage the activity of other organisms, microorganisms that they are in synthesis with the worm. The feeding allows the rupture of the organic matter, but also the formation of aggregate stables. As you know, when you touch vermicompost, you can feel it, the, uh, the texture, how they have created different aggregates. Okay, this is not just like powder, it's not. So this is part of this rupture of the organic matter and the pass through the uh, digestive system of the, of the worms. Disruptor of the organic matter also increase the surface volume ratio. What it, uh, it means that the action of the microorganisms that lives with the uh, earthworms is going to be more intense in the degradation of the organic matter. It's going to help them to de degrade it. And this is a stimulus of the activity of these mic microbials and at the end, all this together accelerates the mineralization and humification and improves the structure of the final product. So this is a combination of physical, chemical and biological actions. There are different species of worms that can be uh, used in vermicomposting. As you can see, the group or the possibilities are really important. And it will depend in which country we are, in which kind of weather conditions we are living. It's not saying we are trying to do vermicomposting in Mongolia, that we are trying to do it here in Spain. Environmental conditions are completely different, or you're living in tropical countries. It's completely different. As you know, this is the more popular, the Isenia. It is called the red worm, also the California worm. And the earliest one discovered. Sorry? The earliest one given reference. Yes. Yes, the different, and but also as you can see there, there are other different species. This is, as I said, this is a, the most popular Isenia andrei, that is also called Isenia fetida. It's different species at the end, but really we are talking with the same characteristics. 
in practical sense, is the same uh, worm. Even there are a lot of papers in the scientific literature that they, not, they do not recognize one from the, for each other. What is very easy to see that, uh, is the, the, the different bands, like, like a tiger that has the Isenia fetida. The Isenia andrei is completely red, or more or less it's continuous, the red color. Here, the Isenia fetida has different bands of white and red. Okay, so this is the, the main difference. But on the practical point of view, you can consider this the same species. So, the Isenia fetida, you can see, okay, this is the different parts of the, of the body. As you know, this is the, the clitellum, this ring, they have the clitellum. It's what recognize the uh, sexual uh, maturity of the, of the animal. And as you can see, they have the two, the two different uh, holes for the, sem, uh, the seminal group and the spermateca for the reproduction. You know, they have uh, both sex in the, in the animal. They are male and female at the same time. This is uh, the Senia fetida, it's a pigeocetity body with rapid growth, early sexual maturity, and a great reproductive mat potential. Okay, so as I said, this is a typical view. As you see, this is the biological cycle of this species. It's more or less in um, five days they are going to have the reproduction, even the auto fertilization of the animal. There are some cases. And they are going to produce the cocoons okay, from this reproduction, more or less on um, half, uh, they're going to take two days to generate the, the cocoon. After 18 to 26 days, they are, you are going to obtain from 2.5 to 3.8 uh, worms for, uh, per each cocoon with a viability of from almost 80%. And after a month, they are going to be adults and they can reproduce it again. So they have a very fast capacity of reproduction of the population in the, in the substrate. That at the end is one, or it can be one of the weakness of this species. That the high reproductivity is going to mean that sooner or later you are going to have a high density of the population. And, it's, and this is not good. Here you can see it. The, the moment of the copula of both animals when they introduce the ring, the clitellum of one in another. Okay, it's really interesting. And these are, as you say, this is are the cocoons. You can see it; they are golden color. And here you have more or less from around three to five, even in some cases, babies. Okay, that when they go out of the Cocoon, they look like this. It's a, a soft pink color. There's another species, Lumbricus rubellus, that is very common here in Europe, that is also PGL, but in some cases, there are authors that consider it epianesic. And it's also related to organic substrates, and it's, very considered, it's considered a very suitable for the production of animal protein because it's a big one, it's a big worm. Okay, as you see, this animal is much bigger than the Isenia. So, in, in some cases, they look for it. You see, uh, the Isenia is less than 0 0.5 grams per animal. Here, the average is around 0 0.8. So, it's, it's a big worm. But the reprodu reproduction rate is lower. Okay, it's one cocoon every four days, more or less. And after 40 days, you are going to obtain one young worm per each cocoon. We were talking with Isenia that almost three, even four. Here we're just talking about one. And after three months, you are going to have an adult again. So the interest of this worm is more related, and the, sorry, the environmental conditions, the optimal environmental conditions are more or less the same. So the intention of use this kind of worm vermicomposting is more for the production of worms more than the uh, treatment of or the production of a vermicompost. There's another species that is also used in vermicomposting that is called Dendrobiana rupida, 
And here it is also a PUC species and it's very akin to organic su substrates. That nowadays it is inv uh, invasive, you can find it in numerous islands all over the world except Antarctica. And also has a very interest, uh, high interest in, in vermicomposting because it can resist lower temperatures they are from 0 to 35 degrees and the reproduction rate is not bad okay you can be talking about seven days to for, from the moment that they are adult sexual adult to reproduce it around a cocoon for every every week more or less and from everyone every cocoon you are going to obtain after 14 days around 1.6 individuals and after 54 days you have then growth to be an adult. The comparison between the different species uh, at the moment you have to decide if you are interested in, in them or not for the use in vermicomposting. You can consider that Dendrobiana rubida because they have a higher range of temperature to, to be uh, biological active it can be interesting and even it is used as a fishing bait, okay, it's also popular in, in that sense. The problem of Lumbricus rubellus, as I said, is the delay they have in reaching the sexual maturity and the low reproductive rate, but also it's quite resistant. The problem is that you need a lot of time to have enough population of worms in your substrates to make it uh, feasible. Isenia fetida or Isenia andrei, it's really has very hungry. It's always eating and excreting around 60% of the, of the material they eat and assimilate around 40%. So the capacity of degradate the organic matter is really high. Plus they have a high reproductivity rate. So this, this is what makes this species really interesting for composting. You have a comparison here for the age of sexual maturity in days and the individuals per worm per week that you can obtain. So as you can see, even the Androvaena ruby that has a quite interesting data, Eisenia fetida in 60 days you are going to obtain more or less, need, need 60 days to have the maturity, sexual maturity, but every time they reproduce you are almost having five individuals for each reproduction. There are others, Perionix scabatus, Eudrilus eugeniae, that has a very, very, very high rates, but they are tropical. So you are not going to find it here in, in our continent. But as you, you can see, there are many options. Okay? It's not only the California worm or the red one. There are many other species that we can consider for composting. As I said before, the, the ideal worm more or less will have these characteristics. Okay, the weight is around 0 0.5 grams. In 60 days you are going to reproduce the population. Uh, cuckoo production, production rate about 0 0.3. A viability, this is important, around almost 90% of viability with three individuals per cocoon. And in less than a month you are going to have new individuals and the net product productivity rate, uh, individual per week and adult, is almost five. So this is what Boucher in 1972 considered the, as the best characteristics that, that, uh, that any airworm should have to be used in vermicomposting. The conditions for growing the Isenia fetida, as I said, they are quite limited. Okay. The temperature should be between 15 to 20 degrees. Okay, we can open the margins. We can go until 30, we can go down until 4 degrees. After those limits, you are going to have problems. The animals are going to try to escape, to looking for better places. Moisture has to be really high. Okay, we have also have some limits, has to be high. Higher than 90% is not possible because the media is going to become anaerobic and the animals will die. They need aerobic conditions. Another limit is the ammonium content of the waste. It has to be low. So when we're talking about 
uh, the treating of slurries, manures, animal uh, dejections, we have to consider that in some cases we need some pretreatment before to feed the animal with, with that kind of waste. Salt content, what is the condu electric electrical conductivity of the material, has to be also very low. That's because of the need of the material to breathe through the, through the body. This, uh, so you have to keep this equilibrium of osmotic equilibrium between the, the, the inner body and the outside. pH between 5 and 9. So this more, these are our limits. And this is the first problem that we have. When we are going to make vermicomposting at an industrial scale, we have to take in consideration our weather conditions. In some cases, in Spain here, and now with the climate change even more, the limits in the temperature are very easy to, to surpass it, to have more than 30 degrees environmental, even less than 4 degrees. So we have to see how we adapt our facility, our installation, to keep these temperatures. Moisture, at the same time, becomes also a problem. It is, it is uh, having hot weather, we have to keep adding water or some kind of liquid with low ammonia, with low salt conditions to keep the humidity of the, of the media where our airworms are working at living. The process, so what, uh, as I said, what we do is a combination of the movement of the activity of the, of the worms with the feeding of the organic matter. This feeding, what it makes when, when, when it passes through all the digestive system of the, of the worm, makes the rupture the organic matter breaks, it is, it creates or it produces the reduction of the size of the particles and it reduces also the surface volume rate. It, it, and the organic matter becomes more uh, exposed to the activity of the microorganisms and it makes the degradation easier. But also, it creates a relationship with other animals, with other microorganisms that live in the soil, like the meats and chytrates, springtails, and also bring or take part in the degradation of the organic matter. At the end, you are going to obtain different kinds of byproducts, not only the vermicompost, okay? This is quite easy. You can also have animal protein that even today is really, really interesting with, for different uh, possibilities and also the production of enzymes and other kind of pharmaceutical materials, products that really, really interesting and have a high value in the market. Parameters in vermicomposting, as you know, the physical structure, the moisture, the salinity and the ammonia, pH, and the process parameters. Okay, at the beginning you have to take it into consideration these four, okay, which is going to be the physical structure because you have to keep it aerobic, the moisture of the uh, of the of the substrate where we are going to to perform the vermicomposting, the salinity and the ammonia, and the pH. When the process begins, the density of the population. If you have a high density of animals the biological activity is going to go down, they are not going, they're going to feel stress and they're not going to eat, they're not going to reproduce it, and sooner or later you are going to have a problem. So you have, from time to time, you have to take out animals, worms from the, from the substrate to keep the population under control. The moisture is essential, the temperature, as I said, you have to keep it under control, and the aerobic conditions. Finally, the pH is not normally that the pH go after or, uh, out of control, but it's important to keep it in, in neutral values or little alkalinic, but to avoid uh, acidic, acidic conditions because it, it will mean not only the death of the worms, it means that the, this organic material has been being decomposed under anaerobic conditions. So, if you have this kind of waste that you want it, to treat it, you have to make it something like that. They need, as you can see, it is really, really moisture. 
here, you know, it's a high level of moisture, but it's what the airworm needs to can breathe and to can reproduce it. So this is important to keep the, the material under these conditions. But at the same time, as you can see, it looks like a sludge, like a mud. So you can't make it a really high, uh, you, can, you can make a high piles or big piles with it because it's going to compress and at the end you are going to become anaerobic. So you need to keep it on small layers of material or if you, if you, you use other kind of recipient, you can keep it always without any pressure on it. So you can keep uh, this material in aerobic conditions. There's also uh, another factors that they use is to keep it under control is to use some kind of uh, elements, equipment like this. This is a thermal resistance to keep it all the substrates under good temperature conditions to allow to, or to avoid, to say to avoid when there is a freezing temperatures outside to keep it uh, all the all the substrate, all the vermicomposter under good temperatures or at least not under as a extreme temperatures. For growth and reproduction, when you are working with a new kind of waste or some kind of waste that you don't have experience, previous experience, you should have some kind of test, initial test, to know if it is avoid, uh, interested or not. One of them could be to take some mature vermicompost and some uh, other substrate that is called vermiculite. I don't know if you know it, it's a mineral substrate. And you add water to it, keep it moisture, you put on it the mature vermicompost and, and in the other side you add the waste you want to investigate, you want to see if it works or not. You add four little worms, juvenile worms on it and you keep it. What we used to do, this was one kind of experiments that we used to do in the university, three replicates of, of its vessel with, the, with this waste and we keep it under vermicomposting conditions, controlled conditions during 12 weeks. And every, every week we make a control counting the number of individuals that are still alive, not the weight, the mass, the development of the clitellum, as you know, to see if they go in mature or not, the production of cocoons, if we find any cocoon on it, and where we find the worms and where we find the cocoon in the vermiculite, in the vermicompost or in the waste. So, as you see, this, this is the, uh, the waste and this is the vermicompost here and you have just a physical barrier that the worms can pass through without problem and you just see how it evolves. As you can see here, this is a experiment we make with um, with industrial waste from a daily factory, okay, they process milk, yogurts, and other kind of daily products, and they generate two kinds of organic waste. One was very rich in fats, and other was organic, but not, with not so high concentra concentration of fats. And also a control that was made with horse manure. Okay, as you can see here in the control, the distribution of the worms in the, in the media is not different, almost there is no difference because the different uh, media. You can find animals in the vermicompost, in the vermiculita or in the waste during all the process, during all the experiment. The solid sludge, one of the, of the um, wastes we, we, we tested, as you see, we almost never found the worms in the, in the waste. Most of the time they were in the vermiculite, so they mean that they, they need protection, they were looking for a, a good environmental conditions and they begin to die very fast. Okay, you see, after the, four, after the first month we begin to, they begin to die and for the end of the experiment there was not warm alive in this, kind of, in, in this waste. Another kind of sludge that this was very uh, high uh, moisture. You can see we found the animals in the waste and since the first control, since the first week. And the mortality of the individuals were really, really low. Just we lost 
two species, uh, two of them in the first month, and then they kept it all the time moving from the waste to the vermicompost without any problem. From the fat uh, wasted, the uh, ones that were rich in fat, you can see this one that was also very liquid, you see it was more or less the same result that, that in this one. There was no many difference in where you can find the worms. But now look at this one, the fat sludge. This was a solid sludge, very rich in fat conditions, and during the first two months, the worms never touch it. They didn't want to go inside it. You can find it in the vermicompost and most of the time in the vermiculite, but after the seventh week, they get into the waste and they didn't go out. They stay there. Well, you have only died, one of them died in, in, in that time. What happened here was in the controls, we found that between the fourth and the seventh the controls, we found that the, all these vessels, the, the surface was full of mites. You know the mite? Uh, this is a very... Tiny Yes. Yeah. Yes. Very, very tiny bugs. Ac in Spanish it's acaro. It's, it's like a little ball with, with legs. It's here and it's, it's very, very, very small okay, and covers all the surface. They eat fungus. Okay, so they cover it completely the surface of the of the vessel, the waste, and when they went out, when this disappear, then the worms go inside the waste, and the uh, the process changes completely. When you see the growth, you can see that this fat sludge. You see, this is the average airworm mass. Okay, so as you can see, most of them, they lost weight during the experiment with the different wastes, except the fat sludge. This one, that the, the moment the, the worms get inside the waste, they begin to grow, to grow, to get big, bigger and bigger. So, it is very important to analyze, to study in the long term how the worms react to the new wastes. If you just perform a mortality test, that is to put from 10 to 100 worms in, in the waste, you are going to see that it's going to die in, in most of the cases. In this, in this experiment, they will die in, in most of them. Uh, fat sludge uh, Sir, what do you mean by sludge? Uh, sludge. Uh, uh, yes, yeah, so you got from the wastewater treatment plant, you know? Uh -huh. After the depuration of the water, you have the clean water and you have some kind of, of sludge, some kind of solid material. Fat is related with the amount of the size size of the you know this waste, or we are talking about the fat with the uh, worms. Fat. No, I'm talking about the uh, characteristics of the of the lads. They have a lot of fat from the milk of the of the cows. Okay. Yes, the factory produced two kinds of organic wastes. Mm -hmm. One was very rich in fats. Mm -hmm. That is what it called fat, and all there is organic matter with others from the depuration. In this environment, the worms are dying, right? If you put the worms directly in these wastes, all of them are going to die. Even here, you, you give them a, an environment where they can be and decide when they go into the waste or not, then the results are different. See, okay, in this case, you take you almost two months until the moment that the worms decide to go inside the waste. But after that moment, they can eat, they can live inside that waste without problem. So when you try to do a mortality test to know the possibilities of use some different wastes in vermicomposting, you have to consider that most of the, of the organic waste, industrial waste, is going to be toxic. 
for the other ones. But if you give them time to change, to, evol to have some evolution, then maybe now the other ones can go inside and they can degrade it, they can live, they can grow in it. So it is important to consider time and, con and the conditions. What does green stand for VCTA? Vermiculite. It's a, it's a mineral substrate we're using in pots when you plant a, a flower or different kinds of plants. It's a, a mineral substrate that retains water okay, and you help you to keep it. So it normally it's mixed with soil to create pot soil to use it at home with the flowers, something like that. So now you're going to see the same results for the cocoons. Where we, how many and where we found the, the cocoons, the average cocoons per earthworms. See, we found cocoons in the control, in the horse manure, in the vermicompost in the control, in the fat sluts, solid sluts, and one, and in fat one. We found uh, cocoons also in, in the vermiculite, in all the cases. But in the waste, we found it in the control, in the horse manure. We found most of them in the fat sluts, the one that they grow so much. They found most of the cocoons there. We didn't find any cocoon in the solid sludge. We found a few of them in a sludge one and very few in fat one. So as you can see, this waste after a two, we two months treatment is very, very, very attractive for vermicomposting. But you need that pre-process, pre-treatment before to go to vermicomposting. You try to do it directly, then you are not going to have any good results. And this is a, a resume of the case. As you can see, the growth rate in the fat sludge were really high. And we were producing around almost six cocoons per week and with a high, really high uh, production rate. Okay, so now we're going to see, this is going to a uh, general point of view, vermicomposting very fast, uh, go to practical examples. This is one, a real case here in Spain, in, in, in Galicia, in the Northwest, which is where I come from, a Coruña. This is a university that has two campus, a Zapatera y El Viña. As you can see, these are different faculties in the in university. And here we do it, local composting, every canteen, every restaurant in the university has its own composting. Yes, no, but it has its own composting facility, community composting scale. Some of them are so small that then we combine and uh, uh, they have a, com a community composting site for maybe two or three restaurants, but it's completely decentralized. Okay, every facility, ha uh, every, faci every faculty has its own composting so system. So they use their own waste? Yes. Not only the food waste, but also all the green waste from the campus, from the maintenance of the green areas of the campus, mm -hmm. are used for the bulky material for composting. So we use both. But also we, we use worms for the maduration of, the, of this compost. Here, as you can see, there are two systems in the traditional composters that you can find in, in any store, okay, around 320 liters capacity. There is uh, uh, three different states, one with waste, uh, fresh waste, food waste. After one to two months, there was a second stage of first uh, maduration and a third maduration with worms that it can uh, still uh, until six months, more or less, with worms. There's also a third, a uh, second line that we use an electromechanical composter that we made of our own a second stabilization process, and finally uh, a verbi composting uh, stage that also takes, in this case, only for three to four months, because these first stages make it the, post the process more efficient. What we do there is that we take all the food waste, we mix it with the bulky material, with this boot, and we feed it di di daily. As you can see, the system is really, really simple. And we add, 
in the last stage we had worms, they are local worms, we didn't buy them, we went to the forest around, we collected from under the leaves that were in the, in the autumn, we take it, we put it in a composter, we took three to five months to have a good population, and then we use it for the vermicomposting of, of the compost. Okay? So in that last stage, we keep them from around two months total, in some cases four, and after that we sieve it and we separate the worms for the, from the vermicompost. So you put the manure on this? No, not manure. Basket, no, no. Worms going outside? No, we just, sorry, we just sieve it directly. We don't separate it by adding on another, in this case, it's from where we take it. We took the, the worms from different places around the, the campus and in some cases they were related to the horse manure because there is a rural area. But when we have it, when we, we finish, we just take the material, we sieve it, we separate the worms from the, from the vermicompost and that's all. We don't, we don't do anything else. As you can see, on all the worms who keep it back for the vermicomposter. Okay, and this is the final product we obtain that is used in the orchards that they have. The university has different orchards for the local community, for the students, from teachers, or, and different personnel in the university. They have a small parcels of, of soil where they can cultivate vegetables or any, anything they want, and we give them the compost for free for the use. Okay, so, and, and this is uh, the aspect of this material. There's also an industrial application of vermicomposting here in Spain. We find uh, many difficulties because also it will depend if we want to treat uh, organic waste or we want to produce vermicompost. It's not the same goal. Okay? If you want to produce vermicompost, then you need a stable and very known source of organic matter because you don't want surprises. You want to know with what you are feeding your animals to have the quality of the product that you want or are looking to obtain. If the, in the opposite situation is I need to treat different kinds of wastes through vermicomposting. So then you need to be very cautious because you don't know or you do not control what you are receiving, what you are getting into your facility. So you have to be sure that you need some kind of pretreatment before to feed the earthworms with the, with the wastes. So, usually you have to count that you're going to need to adapt to pretreat the waste. Also, you have to consider it is a slow process, it takes time. And it's quite difficult to make the process automatic because of the presence of the worms, because the physical and chemical characteristics of the substrate, the high moisture they need, the presence of the animals, so it's not easy to, to make it automatic. And at the end, or at some moment, you need to separate the worms from the vermicompost. So you can't have the both products. As I said, these two different work strategies, some cases they look into obtain a product, solid or liquid, or in other cases, they're just looking for the animal protein. The quality and quantity of the organic matter to be treated is essential. The process time and conditions are essential. If you're looking to obtain animal proteins, is the process conditions have to be the best possible to make the animals grow and reproduce as fast as possible. The most simple vermicomposting that we're going to see is something like that. As I said, small piles, small windrows of material, organic material on the soil, just to have to keep it uh, separated from the, from the soil to avoid the presence of predators, mouses or any, any other, so they use put a, a plastic layer on, on the soil before to put the material. And this is the and some sprinkles are around to keep the moisture of the, of the material. As you can see, this is the most simple system that you are going to you are going to see, but there are other examples. It's also this is a vermicomposting facility. That in the, this case, the 
the staff or the owners use this kind of deposits, the kind of containers. They are recycled, as you know, they are used in, uh, in many civil works, just to, to, to storage water on some kind of chemical products. So they recycle it, they break the tap, and they use it for vermicomposting. They have two advantages. You can't make piles with it, so you can store it easily and move it and decide with uh, different batches, it's very easy. And you also, you can obtain the liquid. Tea. The, yes, the vermicomposting tea. It's quite easy. So you can keep the moisture and you can obtain a, a second product quite easy. And then, as you can see here, they are separating the, the worms, adding uh, this. Uh, this is tray with fresh material, or fresh organic matter, so the the worms go inside and you can separate it. So this is very usual here in Spain to use this kind of system for vermicomposting. Here you have a, a smaller scale, but also this is an industrial facility for composting and vermicomposting. And they do vermicomposting with these uh, strays, as you see. They just make uh, a pile, they are communicated each other, so the animals can go up and down at their will. And at, at the end, you are adding the fresh food waste or the fresh waste on the top, and you are obtaining vermicomposting in the bottom of the materials. Here you have another very simple system. This is in Bolivia. In this case, they use this kind of pools full of manure, in this case. And they are, they are the, the airworms, and they cover it with plastics, okay, and they keep it under the saddle. And as I said, it's very, 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 very simple. Here you have another, this is an industrial facility for vermicomposting. This is in, the, in La Mancha, it's at the south of Madrid, around three hours driving from Madrid. As you can see, this is, a, this is the facility. There's not much more than this. I mean, they, they, all have, they have the screening for the separation, they have the bagging machine, but the process is here, happens here. What they have is this small and long pay piles with the worms, the watering system, okay, this for dripping, and uh, here you can see at the bottom, this is the fresh material they use to feed the, the animals, yeah. yes, uh, with the manures and also some kind of food waste that they compost before. They make a composting and then from with this material they feed the worms. Products ob obtain it, as I said, the organic, the substrate, but also the liquid. Also, the protein, the worms, that you can use it for fish farms, or even bait for fishing, and also this liquid, that it has really, really high value in the market. Okay, if you, I, I know of some uh, facilities that they, they sell more liquid fertilizer than solid. And of course, nowadays, they're looking for enzymes and other kind of chemical products generated within the vermicomposting is really, really important. And they are, they are in, even producing it, uh, on demand. Okay, there are some facilities that they're producing on demand. So, now we're going to see, it's another experiment when, that we did when I was in that big company that I told you before, in the research and development department. And when we were, we've been working with horticultural waste, waste from greenhouses that in the southeast of Spain means millions of tons of vegetables that go to landfill directly, most of the time because they don't want, they have an excess of production and they don't want to uh, <clears throat> low prices in the market. So to avoid it, they send it for landfill, but also the waste from the crops under the greenhouses. So uh, this came from a composting facility that we designed and built there, but also we've been looking for other possibilities of local treatment of this kind of wastes. So uh, we tried to, to test the vermicomposting at, at an industrial scale or at least a semi-industrial scale to see how it can be a possible solution for the, the big problem, the serious problem that we have in this part of the country. This is the problem, that there are tons and tons of vegetables that directly 
send it to landfill or the waste, you see, they are, most of them they are perfect, but also all the wastes from the crops, from the collection of the crops. So, this is sugar and water, practically. It's, it's possible to compost this, yes, you can compost it, but you have a problem. The excess of water that is going to be generated, that is going to become leachated, and it will, you need a high quantity of bulky material to balance this excess of moisture, this excess of water that this kind of material has. So it becomes possible, but at a higher or relatively high cost. So we, but at the same time, with so high quantities of water, you say, okay, maybe composting, uh, sorry, vermicomposting could be a, a solution, a possibility. You see, this is what they call waste. So we test with this semi-industrial vermicomposter that it was designed in the University of Vigo, that was the university from where I came from I, when I did my PhD. And this is a semi-automatic system. There are two beds that can be combined like this, in vertical, but also in horizontal. You can use both at the same time. And they have a system that just pass at the bottom of the material with some teeth, so it breaks the vermicompost that is at the bottom of, the, of this bed and make it pass through the mess and keep the, the fresh material on top. So we place it like this in a cover place, avoid from the sunlight and we begin to, to test. This is the hydraulic system that allows the move of those rasks at the bottom of, the, of these beds. You see, these teeth move up and down, up and down now, go and forward, and it makes that movement that provokes that the vermicompost go through the, this mesh, this net, and the material is going down. You feed it on top and you are obtaining the barbie compost from the bottom. So we have to prepare the substrate, the medium, to make it so first, of course, this is a big mess, so if you begin to put it here, barbie compost or waste, it's going to pass through it. So we use some kind of rest of crops, vegetable, vegetal material, big leaves, something like that, that, that is easy degradable, but it's going to take a few days. So we, we make a first layer with this material, as you can see, the rest from tomato plants, cucumber plants, something like that. And then we have the, the, the worms and the vermicompost that we, in this case, we bought them. We were to an industrial facility, industrial vermicomposting facility, to buy the worms. And we make some different tests at the beginning to see how it works, if we had any kind of problems. You have to take in, into account that most of these crops have high rate or high levels of pesticides. So you have to be a little aware that maybe it's not useful for the direct application. And we use horse manure to create a first lay of material where we know that the worms are going to be safe and comfortable. So it was this, the first layer of uh, vegetables, second of horse manure, and we, we place the worms there in the horse manure, and we begin to prepare the, the waste, organic waste. Then we found that we had a little problem, that most of these tomatoes, cucumber, they were intact. So the, the worms can bite. So if you need them to go inside, you have to break these tomatoes, these fruits, these vegetables, before to give it to, to, to the earthworms. To the so we try different systems. Here in Spain, we call this gazpacho. It's a typical tomato soup that we're making here in Spain. So we, we try to make it at an industrial level with different kinds of devices. You see? So we try it. And we create this kind of soup at the beginning to feed the, uh, the soups, the, the, those both layers, as you said, those two vermicomposters. 
we, sp we spread it on top of the horse manure and we were seeing what was happening. See, after the first, this is the first feeding what we did. And immediately the worms were, were, went inside. There was no problem at all. This, what you see here, this golden material is the, is the peel of the tomato peel. Because it was intact. You know, it takes time to be degraded, but the, the inside of the tomatoes, cucumbers, it, it was very easily degradable and the worms really feed on, on, on it. There was no problem at all and we found mat adults mature ad adults very, very, very fast. As you can see here, they were completely comfortable on this. So our second step, looking for an industrial point of view, was okay, it is possible, but now we need to include some kind of automatisms to make it feasible at the industrial level. So the first was how we can make the feeding of the worms automatic. Until that moment, we've been doing by hand. And we designed this kind of device that it's just uh, a recipient, you know, like this, that goes on, on wheels, like a train. It goes on. I have a question, sorry for interruption. Yes. In Turkey, we don't use the tomato waste because they are acidic. Because it's acid. acid. Here, yes, but that's why here we use the horse manure. So the, the worms have a safe place where they can stay and decide, and decide when they go to eat and come back to a safe place. They, they are not directly in the waste. They decide when they go and down. So, the, and also they have two cylinders that they, with a, a very simple system, mechanisms, it creates, a, it breaks the tomato. It does, in, yes, exactly. Make it go down, but it not uh, press it. They just break it, okay? You can compensate it. And you see, it makes it like this. So it moves directly on the lace of the, of the material. We feed it with the front loader and we, with the displacement, on the top of the of the vermicomposter, you create a layer of food waste, or in this case, tomato and cucumber waste, that was ready to be degraded by the by the other ones. You see, the, like the material like this, like this. So immediately, the worms and all the microorganisms that they are living in this layer can begin the degradation of the material. And you can, in this case, we begin to do it by hand. Then later, it can do it mechanically. Why do we do those tomatoes look very healthy? Why do they use worms? Because it's a waste here. Because as I said before, it's an excess, an excess of production I from see. the farmers. They don't want that the, the prices drop on the market. So to keep it, the prices high, they send it for landfilling. This is stup human stupidity. So, uh, and it becomes a, a real problem here in, in the southeast of Spain. And the, uh, with the test, we, we demonstrated that we can't use it 150 kilograms daily with, the, with this uh, vermicomposters without any problem, with high production rates of vermicompost and animals. Some other cases, so just going fast, in Bolivia, as I, I commented before, here you have in Sucre, this is, in, uh, is a composting facility that has also a vermicomposting area. As I said before, there are these pools full of uh, horse manure and, and where they keep it uh, covered with plastics in a saddle area and they produce a high quality compost also and to separate the worms from the from the vermicompost when the vermicompost is ready they make these balls in, in a net a ball of fresh horse manure they put it inside the substrate and the the worms go inside and they can separate it from the vermicompost. You see, and they use different species. There are also Eisenia, but they have also Dendrobina rubida, also mix it, living together. In Brazil, you have a very interesting uh, example of home composting, but it really is home vermicomposting. In the city of Sao Paulo, they call it Composta Sao Paulo, where more than 2,000 inhabitants, well, families, are performing vermicomposting 
in system so simple like this, a big tower, there are the three uh, strays that you, it's, uh, it's like this. You see one first, a smaller of 28 liters for the collection of the leachate, and then a first one of 50 liters, second and third. You begin to feeding in this one, the worms go up and down, up and down, until this is converted in vermicompost, and you add a second one, where you add the fresh food waste, the worms doing the same, going up and down, and when you place the third, you, at the end you have the, the first one, it's already vermicompost, so you can take it out, the worms will be moving between the second and the third, because there's no more to eat here in the first, so you can take it out, and then replace the second go to the first, and the first go to be on top, for, to keep it working. As I said, it's been working for more than 10 years. They create a community in Facebook where they, uh, they have all the materials that the people created, all the handbooks, all the fact, say, frequent ask questions to help the newcomers to, 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 uh, to be professional vermicomposters with their own food waste. And it's a, it's a really, really interesting process. They also create seminars and events to share all the information, to share we have these problems, how others have solved it. As I said, it's a very interesting and you can find them in Facebook with this activity. Just to, to finish, other composting animals, other kind of vermi and not vermi composting, you know the black soldier fly. It's become more and more popular for the use in, in the waste treatment. It comes from America, but now you can find it almost in a place here in Europe. It's now uh, quite popular. The, the larvae that is like it is really, really voracious. It has, eats a lot uh, during that phase. And even you can find it here in the community composting sites in summertime, spring and summertime, you can find that your composter moves because they have a high population of this kind of larvae inside. The, the, the fly finds organic waste, organic matter, the putty eggs, and in, in very few days you are going to have the larvae eating it. This is, they are big, they are relatively big, so there are people that are a little scared about them. And uh, it's completely harmless and do not affect the process. Here you have it in action. You see, this is inside a composter, a community composting, and you can see all the larvae here. So now you can find industrial facilities where they use this kind of animals for waste treatment for the production of animal protein. Okay, the vermicom, not vermicompost, but the, pro the product that they, you have with these animals is, it doesn't have the quality of a vermicomposting. Okay, it's an organic matter, more or less stabilized, but it's not sanitized, you are going to find pathogens, and the quality of this organic matter is not the same than the vermicompost or even a compost. So usually they keep it in process, they make this first stage with this larvae, with the black soldier fly, and then a second step of maturation to finish, complete the process with uh, composting conditions. So because of that, there are some people that get scared and they think, oh, I don't want to have this close to my house, but no, this is not going to happen, okay? So no problem at all. As I said, what they use is to produce animal protein for the fish farming, for poultry farming, more, and in some cases, the, um, the capacity of degradation of these animals is so high that, as I said, they have created some factories for the treatment of food waste or from towns and cities through this kind of animal. You can find it in South America, in South Africa, in China, you can, have, you can find different kinds of factories using the black soldier fly for the waste treatment. As I said, the reproductive, reproductive cycle is really short, only three weeks, and they are really resistant. Okay, so, and really angry. It's, so it's really, really uh, efficient in the food waste treatment. Okay, and you can see here another kind of local example in Costa Rica and San Fernando, where they're doing the same at a local level in the households, and they keep the material, the organic matter, well, food waste under these conditions, it smells, because it's 
kind of event. You can see here all these larvae eating the, the food waste. So that's all that I have to say. Thank you very much. I hope it was interesting for you. And if you have any question, any <laughs> comment? <laughs>